Um, so my first memories of bombings to occur on American soil date back to April 19, 1995. It's the date of the Oklahoma City bombing. The sole image I remember of this horrific event is that of a fireman cradling in his arms a baby, a barely a year old, covered in blood. This image, published nation and worldwide, was the beginning of my personal knowledge about atrocities intentionally committed by man upon my country, my people. Of course, I had knowledge of other atrocities committed against humanity prior to this event, thanks to photos like these, and others that had gained the status of iconic, which had entered my memories and the collective memory in general. Yet what did I learn about the bombing from these news photographs, this news pho photograph? What did I learn about other historical moments in the iconic images illustrated? According to Claude Cookman, the primary objective of photojournalism is to be a witness to history and to record it. In journalism, the aim of the photograph is to illustrate in pictures that words alone can't describe, often taboo subjects. In other words, images of the unspeakable, of the indescribable. Journalism's role is to inform, but what new information do readers get from news photo photographs? Always accompanied by a caption in order to provide the details the photograph is unable to communicate, especially factual or temporal context, and to anchor the message, the photograph in its journalistic function requires an association between the two, a binary system of word and image. More elegantly put by Richard B. Stoley, former correspondent of Life magazine and then editor of both People Weekly and Life, pictures without words is merely photography. Pictures with words is photojournalism. Thus, under this premise, is the news photograph an indescribable image, condemned the status of eye-catcher, all the while illustrating very little. Through the example of three news photographs taken um, with the primary goal of informing the American readers about the Oklahoma City bombing, Chris Fields with Bailey Allman by Charles Porter, the attack on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, so the picture is called The Fireman Raising the, the Flag at Ground Zero by Thomas E. Franklin, who's a photojournalist at Bergen Record, and the bombing during the Boston Marathon, The Fallen Runner by John Tulmecki of the Boston Globe, we will demonstrate that the news photograph remains by nature indescribable. The photographs chosen by news agencies for their capacity to represent the bombings, and which are among the most widely circulated, don't inform readers of much. They are in fact selected for their aesthetic and pedagogic appeal to transmit American values and create national unity. Ordinary people finding themselves implicated in extraordinary events become heroes. The essence of tragedy is reduced to resilience and pride of the American people. Images of the indescribable, the unspeakable, abound in news photographs. What's being questioned is the news photograph's capacity to describe and to express, or rather inform. By definition, an indescribable image can't be characterized by language. Attempts to describe with words fall short of the reality. Photographs used to depict the news are indescribable in that they leave the reader with shortcomings in their comprehension of the event. News photographs function as what WGT Mitchell refers to as the image text, where the image does not simply illustrate the text, it is a combination creating an intermeshed unit in which word and image mutually complement and reinforce each other. So what do we learn from these news images? A medium shot of a fireman focuses our attention upon him. He is holding a baby that is inert and covered in some blood, but otherwise it looks fine. The contrast to the baby, the fireman is clean, no dust, no blood, nothing. He is serenely looking down at the baby, contemplating its face. Time seems to have slowed down or stopped. There is no sign of movement, movement in the image. The background is slightly blurred, but we can distinguish, distinguish some bushes on the ground and the shadow of the branches upon a wall. The sunny spring day contrasts with the stillness of the child who lays as if asleep. The fireman's gloves have been taken off so as the rough texture may not hurt or bother the child. We learn the child has been saved. Saved from what? Who knows? The medium shot excludes any background information that could reveal the scene. We don't really know anything. The photograph itself remains quite ambiguous, or on the contrary, straightforward. 
The fireman is doing his duty to save people, in this case, a baby. The next two images of attacks on America's soil function different, differently. The first two um, images is focusing on American servicemen, again, in the line of duty. According to David Friend, author of Watching the World Change, the story behind the images of 9-11, September 11th, 2001 was the most widely observed event in media history. He adds, the situation was not to, belie to be believed, so you couldn't help but get unbelievable pictures. The vast majority of pictures that circulated were of the explosion, but also people caught in the explosion, the destruction, horror, grief, and desperation of the event. One of the most widely published images in the direct aftermath of the event was the raising of the flag on Ground Zero. A long shot perspective places the, the three firemen against a monochromatic background wall of debris. The only colors standing out are from the tops of their clothes and the red, white, and blue of the American flag. The viewer's gaze follows that of the firemen, focusing their attention on the flag. The mast appears to be stable, as none of the men are holding it up. But the flag is at half-mast, and they are either in the process of hoisting it up or lowering it. What do we learn? Even in the midst of destruction, American firemen are patriotic, and that it takes three to hoist a flag. <laughs> the third... News photograph offers an even longer shot, placing the subjects into a context of a full scene. The photograph respects the aesthetics of a well-balanced image. In the foreground, the bright orange of, uh, of the runner's jersey stands out against the gray of the asphalt. The viewer's eye is inevitably drawn to the vanishing point in the background of the image, either through a dynamic zigzag or motion from the officer to officer, or in a less dynamic, however more balanced vision of a triangle formed by the various police officers. Perspective is enhanced by the paling of the background, despite the short distance separating the foreground from the background. Yet as the eyes travel across the image, <coughs> little is disclosed. The body language of the various people present in the, present in the picture indicate some sort of chaos. The runners on the ground, officers are frozen in action, drawing their guns from their holsters. Yet the fallen runner doesn't appear to be the source of panic or worry. The gaze of all the officers, except for one, are focused outside the frame. It is difficult to discern other runners, but on a closer inspection of the photo, a few are visible on the left, behind the woman officer. Sponsor banners fly, flags ripple, and a crowd in bleachers indicate a sporting event in the streets. What street? What city? What event? Why is the runner on the ground? Why are the officers running? These three news photographs alone don't inform us of much. Lacking frame of reference or circumstantial details, the photographs are unable to answer many of the questions the pictures themselves evoke. The pictures remain mute in their journalistic sense. It is only as an image text that meaning becomes clear. The photograph of the Oklahoma bombing was published on the front, the front page of the Daily Oklahoman, along with another photo, both in color, re-emphasizing the reality of the event. Based upon the size, flushed left and right, covering nearly half the page, and the location at the top of the page, it is evident that the importance of the photograph by Porter, as you can see in the little square rectangle, is secondary to the main image that illustrate, illustrates the destruction caused by a bomb to a most likely very familiar building to Oklahoma City inhabitants. This fact is pointed out to the reader in the subtitle, City Struggles with Shock of Deadly Bombing. However, it is the headline, Morning of Terror, terror in large, bold font that stands out. Together, these two photographs, the headline and the subhead, weave together the story without much investment on behalf of the reader. Not only does the reader immediately understand that there has been an explosion, but a deadly one at that. The function of the second image is, is to immediately inform the readers of the results of the bombing. Not only was the building completely destroyed, lives were lost, and more pathetically, the lives of young children. The related article states, small children victims in daycare center. The legend points out, a firefighter carries a child injured in the explosion in downtown Oklahoma City on Wednesday. The emphasis of the larger photograph is on the destruction that has reverberated beyond the building itself, as can be remarked by the destruction caused to the cars. 
The fireman in the photograph has taken off one of his gloves in order to use his camera. Even to one who is used to facing trauma, destruction, and even death on perhaps a daily basis, the event is apparently beyond his realm of normal and needs to be documented as extraordinary. His downcast look be in disbelief, grief, or simply for protection physically from the smoke and dust, or emotionally from the unprecedented, unimaginable, and indescribable horror. Through the synthetic work of image text, the photograph's meaning becomes audible. The fireman, unfortunately, is not just going about his routine of saving people from fires or other common accidents. He has joined the rescue workers to help save lives of those victims caught in the explosion. Tomaki's photograph, photographic rendition of the Boston Marathon bombing is quite powerful and aesthetically balanced, as we saw. However, Boston Globe photographer David L. Ryan snapped another image of virtually the same scene, less aesthetic, but less enigmatic, Take, uh, taken at almost the exact moment as the previous shot. In fact, we can see Tomaki in the foreground, where I put the little arrow, and the officers are in the same frozen position, ready to run. The long shot places the action seen in the first photograph into perspective with the surroundings, a large avenue in the midst of buildings defying the city state, cityscape, even if the exact city is still indistinguishable, except for Bostonians, perhaps. The cause for the pallid background becomes slightly clearer, as we now are able to see smoke billowing in the background, what appears to have been bleachers full of spectators now become obvious that the spectators are in motion trying to flee. Chaos and confusion have been captured. It is clear that a sporting event was taking place. Numerous runners are seen amassing on the opposite side of the billowing smoke. Their path has become blocked by officers wearing reflective vests and non-athletes such as those pushing the stroller. Ryan's image is more informative and provides a better understanding of an explosion during a sports event. Both images made the front pages of newspapers around the country on April 16, 2013. Interestingly, interestingly enough, neither were chosen for the print cover of the Boston Globe, the newspaper that both photographers work for. Tamaki's, however, was chosen for the cover of the Internet site, aimed paradoxically at a much broader audience. The cover of the print edition is also one of Tamaki's photos, but it, it is but it emphasizes the aftermath, what resulted from the explosion, since most readers of the Boston Globe were already aware of what had occurred. The new message here is of bloodshed and terror. In analysis of 500 newspaper front pages, only 99, which is around 20%, uh, included this third picture by Tamaki or other pictures that could be considered graphic due to the presence of blood. The graphic image that occurred the most was either the same on the front page of the Boston Globe or another one that has been claimed by some as being iconic. This is of Jeff Bowman, taken by Charles Krupa of the Associated Press. Almost every newspaper ran this image, excuse me, every, almost every newspaper that chose to run this image included, included this cropped version that was the least gruesome instead of making visual the horrifically, horrifically indescribable. Subheadlines highlighted the carnage. Bolton Street was covered in blood and specified the number of casualties. News photographs see their role to record what, has hap what was happening. Sorry, news photographers see their role to record what was happening, documenting facts, being the eyes of those not there. Eris Economopoulos photographer claimed as he was taking pictures of 9-11, my job is to document news and explain what's happening in contacts. However, this quick presentation has pointed out that news photographs are image text and can't do their job alone. It is their association with headlines, captions, and articles which provide the details necessary to fully inform the public. In a fraction of a second, the event is understood, much less so if the news newspaper only relies on the text and even more inexplicable if it only provided the image. Cookman points out that while photojournalists' immediate objective may be the next morning's front page, many hope their images transcend the ephemeral nature of a newspaper or magazine to form a visual record of the era. 
the three news photographs have acquired a life beyond their first publication. A simple Google search reveals claims that all three of these pictures have attained icon status, primarily because they are widely circulated, thus easily recognized, and defining images of the event itself. In their book, No Caption Needed, Harriman and Lucates provide a definition of icons. They are easily re recognized by many people of various backgrounds. They are objects of veneration and other complex emotional responses. They are reproduced widely and placed predominantly in both public and private settings, and they are used to orient the individual within a context of collective identity, obligation, and power. They come to represent large swaths of historical experience, and they acquire, they acquire their own histories of appropriation and commentary. Using this definition as a starting point, the example of these three images of attacks on American soul illustrate the pedagogic shift of news photographs from information suppliers to recorders and then to agents of civil conduct. By the time Porter's photograph made it to the cover of Newsweek on May 1, 1995, and Tomoki's photograph of Bill Ifrig appeared on Sports Illustrated, the vast majority of Americans had already been informed of the respective bombings and had already seen images on television and newspapers. The famous Sports Illustrated cover obscures any semblance of understanding by the magazine title. Only the fallen runner and the police officers are worthy of attention, and the little information provided by the background in the original shot has been intentionally removed through the layout process. The words function as a visual wall, cutting off the viewer's possibility to see beyond. At this moment, the meaning of the news photograph has shifted from proof to embodiment of the catastrophe. The fireman and the baby, the fallen runner, had become symbol of the bombings. Looking at raising of the flag at ground zero, it is impossible to get beyond the symbolic, as it blatantly mimics Joe's Rosenthal's flag of our fathers. I should have put that picture, I forgot to, sorry. <laughs> um, Franklin recalled, for a brief moment, the similarity to Joe Rosenthal's picture, raising the flag on Iwo Jima, flashed through my mind and I recognized the symbolism. The medium shot places the fireman in a context of destruction, but didn't provide any new information about 9-11. It was immediately icon within icon. The historical comparison is used to make the scale and the importance of the event intelligible. Franklin's photo was used for the record and put on the Associated Press wire shortly after midnight. The picture, he said, took on a life of its own. Before going viral, almost all of America and the world were aware of what had just occurred on that September day. Less a document of historical fact, Franklin's photograph served to trigger the nation's visual memory. Context or not, news photographs or icons, these photos are highly emotionally charged. The most disturbing, especially on a personal level, as a mother of child, of a young child, is the Oklahoma bombing picture. The inclusion of children, the weakest members of society and symbol of innocence, in news photographs exacerbate the absurdity of terrorist acts and the senselessness of harming innocent victims. The overtly troubling image evokes moral wrongdoing, especially when placed in perspective with the claims made by the bomber, Timothy McVeigh, that the children were just collateral, collateral damage. This news photograph documents, in the manner of Roland Barthes, in his book, Camera Lucida, a world that no longer exists, what is lost now, victims who were loved ones, friends, family, fellow citizens. Pathos is increased through the inter-iconosity with the Pieta. The pyramidal structure formed by Mary's head and the body of Jesus is mir mirrored identically. Even the body positions are the same, the similarity in their gaze. The mother's grieving over the death of her son. The fireman bemoans the loss of the innocent child. The wounds of Jesus from the crucifixion are mirrored in the child's wounds. It is a visual plea for, of, for pity, for the child didn't sacrifice itself. It had been unwillingly taken, and no sins to be atoned for. 
In contrast with Porter's photograph, and more importantly, in contrast with the plethora of images illustrating the horror and destructions of 9-11 attacks, the emotional register of Franklin's raising the flag at ground zero engages American pride, accentuated by the gold, the bold, God bless America, splashed across the cover. The photographer explains, this was an important shot. It told more than just death and destruction. It said something to me about the strength of the American people and these firemen having to battle the unimaginable. <coughs> Captain Patrick Burns, the U.S. Navy liaison to New York at the time, adds, there's no self-pity in that picture. Pulling on the cords of pride and grief, these news photographs allow anyone to have a sense of personal affiliation with large-scale events. In reference to the Newsweek cover on September 24, 2001, Ted Spiker states, the photograph of Thomas Franklin of the Bergen record quickly became the iconic image that signaled the transition in the mood of the nation from destruction to conviction. That was the mood dictated visually almost immediately after the initial shock had passed. This shift in visual rhetoric also occurred from the time of the Oklahoma bombing in the new into the new age of war on terrorism, from pathos to pride to resilience. Americans weren't licking their, their wounds. They had wiped their noses and had yet again pulled themselves up from their bootstraps to defy anyone to try and knock them down. On September 14, 2001, in her article for Time magazine, If You Want to Humble an Empire, Nancy Gibbs wrote, If you want to humble an empire, makes sense to me, maim its cathedrals. Do we now panic, or will we be brave once the dump trucks and bulldozers have cleared away the rubble, once the streets are swept clean of ash and glass, once we have begun to explain this to our children and to ourselves, what do we do? What else but build new cathedrals? And if they are bombed, build some more. Because the faith is in the act of building, not the building itself, and no amount of terror can keep us from scraping the sky. Approximately eight hours after the first airplane crashed into one World Trade Center, and after six hours, that latter 157, that was Daniel McWilliams' team of firemen, had been working, looking for survivors in the rubble. The story goes, the firefighters found the flagpole within the rubble about 20 feet off the ground of West Street. They used an improvised ramp to climb to the pole to raise the flag. As they performed their act, Franklin, the photographer, aimed his long lens in their direction. McWilliams, the fireman, remembered that other fire personnel yelled, good job, way to go, and every pair of eyes that saw that flag got a little brighter. That firefighter's act of raising the flag resonated with the firemen on site, but also with all Americans. Immediately after the Boston bombings, the media and other commentators designated several images as being iconic. Each one is more than just a witness to history. They transmit sentiments, sentiments of determination and resilience. They shock. The shock of the blast may have knocked Bill Ifrig down, but accompanying and follow-up articles repeatedly point out that his one thought when he was forced to the ground was for him to stand back up and finish the race. Jeff Bowman was a survivor as well. His story was covered extensively by the media, and he has appeared as a sort of mascot at sporting events and other events. He wrote a book to be relate, released in April 8, 2014, with the title, Stronger. And the presentation claims, Jeff will show the terrorists that they accomplished nothing with their act of cowardice, and prove to the entire world that Boston strong really means. Each one of these end stories only makes their pictures more powerful and resonant. Once the shock had pass passed, slogans of resilience abounded immediately, Boston strong, or a more general appeal, appeal with the slogan, be strong. Of course, the American excess of merchandising took advantage of the Boston Strong movement as entrepreneurs interpreted and sold apparel and accessories, making reference to the event. Nevertheless, through these slogans, the reprinting of images, and the stories, Americans exhibit their solidarity. 
As the city came together for the first home game following the tragic events, the Red Sox public address announcer said to an eruption of cheers, we are one, we are strong, we are Boston, we are Boston strong. When speaking to Americans immediately after the bombing, President Barack Obama said in a speech, Boston is a tough and resilient town, so are its people. Images such as these provide a more or less idealized sense of national identity and national drive. Aroused through emotional appeal and the universality of grief, patriotism, or resilience embodied in the news photograph is all part of the myth of iconic images. The subject seen as iconic assumes universe, universal condition. All Americans in post-attack world are incited to move quickly from devastation to determination. News photographs are insidious by being able to mask power relations behind the appearance of natural with photos of the real world. News photographs of the attacks on America exemplify ideology at work. Artfully manufactured sentiments ranging from patriotism to grief are used to justify state action. Americans are shown that they are resilient in order to uphold the government's intention to retaliate. In his study for his book, Diplopie, uh, Diplopie Clément Chéroux points out that through intericonicity and the sliding of messages, the towers billowing with smoke were linked to Pearl Harbor. Chéroux demonstrates that the spontaneous connection between Pearl Harbor and 9-11 also stems from the fact that in 2001, that in 2001, it was the 60th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Flags of Our Father by James Bradley was a paperback bestseller throughout 2001. And the blockbuster at that time was Disney Studio, Studio, Studios Pearl Harbor. The linking of 9-11 attacks to Pearl Harbor transmitted the message that retaliation was the logical response. America's ensuing war on Iraq was no sort of revenge but a just war. Creating similitudes between the Boston Marathon and 9-11, the government policy of retribution becomes a just war as well. Rhetoric within the headlines and subheadlines clearly put it on par with 9-11. Words such as terror or even twin blasts were recurrent. Presidential rhetoric of the marathon bombing evokes 9-11 as well. The Chicago Tribune's headline quotes Obama, we will find out who did this, which echoed George Bush's claim on September 12th that, I quote, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible. The link was established visually as well. An internet, internet website, for instance, redirected the political slogan last used to commemorate 9-11 to Boston runners and all of Americans by extrapolation. The image text rhetoric function as a syllogism. 9-11 discourse is linked to World War II. Boston Marathon discourse is linked to 9-11. State retaliation against terrorists becomes justified. News photographs are thus influential on public opinion by making some beliefs and actions more intelligible, probable, and appealing, and others less so. In this case, by providing emotional approbation for Washington's reprisal, against those deemed terrorists and capable of inflicting such grief upon its valiant people. The government thus rendered its actions legitimate. Attacks on America have been captured by news photographs and are anchored in the national collective memory in a few extraordinary photographs. These news photographs, before becoming a record of their era, were first and foremost image text informing readers of the events they represented. These photographs have been published to construct a community's understanding of present, and they will be used to construct a community's sense of past. But the meaning they impart relies heavily on the context that surrounds it, reinforcing the unstable nature of photographs in creating meaning. Even news photographs adapt to temporal, cultural, social, and political contexts. Cheroux demonstrates that the same photographs of 9-11 published in international news could in fact elicit a completely contradictory understanding. The billowing smoke emerging from the towers and victims running from the crumbling towers triggered images of Hir Hiroshima and Vietnam instead of Pearl Harbor. The ensuing message linked 
9-11 as a consequence of the suffering inflicted on the world by American policy. Or another analysis of the news photographs reveals a disproportionate number of white Americans, which could lend to a social discourse questioning the domination by white America and its consequences. In short, news photographs' polysemic nature confirms their inability to be anything much more than a depiction of the indescribable, remaining almost speechless on their own. As the saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words, but thank goodness there are words to help explain the picture. Thank you.